Well, hey, I'm Josh Walters, if we haven't met, and this is my wife, Katie, and we are so excited to be here with you this weekend. We kicked off the year. We've been in a series called Battlegrounds, and I would say mine and Katie's life verse is John 10.10. It says, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come, says Jesus, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And man, for the first six, seven years of our marriage, we ran hard after that abundant life. Some translations say a rich, full, and satisfying life. And man, that's what we saw marriage to be. That's what we thought our life was going to be. But the problem was... Up and to the right. Up and to the right. We (laughs) lived as if the first half of that verse weren't equally true. That we have an enemy. And he doesn't want to just inconvenience our lives or make it problematic or discourage us. But in a very real sense, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy the plans that God has for our lives, the promises that he's given us. So we kicked off the year really focused on that. We had 21 days of prayer and fasting. First weekend of the year, we looked at who our enemy is. It's not each other. We have a real enemy. The second week, Pastor Josh talked to us about there's a fight that that we can't win, and that's the fight against each other, but there's a fight that we can't lose when we in unity go after our enemy and take ground for the kingdom of God. Pastor Joel talked with us about what it looked like to fight for our faith to stand firm and put on the full armor of God. Last week, Pastor Greg talked with us about the mindset of a warrior and uh, how we train in times of peace is the best predictor of how we'll stand in times of war. And so this week, we're going to look at a battleground that we all experience, and it is the battleground of relationships. How many of you would agree with me that oftentimes, whether it's a friendship or a marriage, you really don't know the strength of the relationship until you've experienced some conflict together? Yeah, it's true, until it's been tested. Until it's been and you tested. know, you think about this battleground of relationships, and I don't know about you, but I'm not the kind of person that wants to sign up for a battle. I always tell Josh he was like made to die. I mean, he's such a warrior and yeah. so fierce he is. What else am I? <laughs> I will stop right there, even though he would love that if I just take a moment. But it's true. You know, he he has that mentality. But for me, I'm like, just the act of showing up to a battle, you know, I know it's not going to be a pleasurable experience, but also that there might be this call to die, this call to lay down our lives. And Jesus was the ultimate model for this for us in relationships, that he sacrificed even to the point of death. You know, we saw him love and serve all the way even to the point of death. And so when we think about this battleground of relationships, I don't know when you think about your relationships, girlfriends, girls' nights, small group, how often you think about actually dying, but I don't all that often, except for this one time. So our small group, we've been in a small group here for about 16 years since we've been at Seacoast, and our small group used to always go camping together. It was like the best thing because we had a ton of little kids and they could just run around like banshees in the woods, you know, and we all had tents. Well, one year in really safe and responsible ways. Right. Obviously. (laughs) (laughs) One year we decided we're going to go all in. We're going to get a lake house all together and we're going to all stay in this actual lake house. No tents. So we get there, and we were the last ones there. Walters were late, which is shocking. We were the last ones to get there, so they had already decided, like, all the different rooms in the house and where people were sleeping. So when we get there, they've told us that we're going to be in the master suite. I'm talking this thing was huge. It had this huge bathroom and bathtub, and I think it had something to do with the fact that we had the most kids, and we also had the youngest kid. We only had a one-year-old at the time, but I'm telling y'all, I did not think I was the kind of girl that needed the master suite until I had it. And I was feeling myself. Like, I just was like, they gave us the queen and king spot. I mean, I was just like loving this moment in this room. So until that night, we go to sleep that night and I have the craziest dream. It was so traumatic. It was like there was this huge avalanche coming. And y'all know this is where dreams get weird. But there was a tunnel that we all had to escape out of to escape this avalanche. And going into this tunnel was every single family in our small group. I could see them all lined up. And it was like the whole dream. Jesus was asking me, like, could you go last? Could you let these other families go out of the tunnel first? And I'm talking the whole dream. I am just tormented. I wake up the next day. I'm struggling all day because I'm like, I don't know if I could do it. 
I don't know if I could die for these people. Like, I'm supposed to love them. We're supposed to be pastors. Like, we're supposed to lay down our life. I just don't think I can do it. And I'm just in my head struggling (laughs) with this all day. And he can tell, like, something's going on. So that night, finally, I just come to him, like, all vulnerable, tender. And I'm like, babe, I had this dream, and I just don't know. I just don't know if I could die. I don't know if I could go last. And he looks at me, and he goes, yeah, not a chance. (laughs) Like... Not everybody everybody knows. <laughs> everybody knows the basic rule of avalanches. Okay? It's like save yourself. <laughs> Avalanche is coming. You don't get orderly. We're not lining up small group. Adele and Anthem, I need you to stop crying. We're gonna let the Gentners go. It's their turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, when he said it no. like that, like you think I'm gonna tell Adele and Anthem, sorry, you're gonna die. We're gonna let this other family live, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, would you say it like that? But the, the, the funniest thing is after the first service, this couple came up to us and they said, well, I mean, we're just dying to know the whole time, did you give up the master bedroom? And I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on. It's like, I never even considered that. <laughs> I may die for you, but you're definitely not getting my room, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the craziest thing is that honestly, we don't often think about this, like it's this call to die. But the truth is, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to unity, when it comes to this family of God, this is the call. And Pastor Greg taught us last week, he said from, um, from 2 Corinthians 10, 1, He says, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What he was telling us is that there are going to be weapons that we're going to have to engage with in this battle of relationship that are not going to be like the world's. They are going to cause this death to self. Yeah. And Jesus gave us the model for relationship. One, in terms of starting in our relationship with him, Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So on a very foundational level, our relationship with him is going to be marked by a willingness to die to ourselves daily. Uh, to take up our cross, to follow after him. But then that model is laid over all of our relationships. In order for a friendship, in order for your marriage to thrive, if you're going to experience healthy relationships, there's going to be times where you have to deny yourself, times where you have to die to yourself. He told us that in Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, we, we understand that in some ways when it comes to visibly how we die for the people that we're in relationship with, when it comes to things that we would put on our calendar, ways that we would sacrifice our resources, our time, our gifts. But this weekend, we want to talk about the death that's a little less visible to everyone on the outside, and it's the inner death. There's some parts inside of our hearts that have to die in order to thrive in relationship. And much of what we're going to be talking about is principles we learned during our brutal season of marriage about 15 years ago that we wrote about in our book that just came out, New Marriage, Same Couple, which we're stoked about. And so if you're intrigued by any of what we talk about today, you can pick that up wherever books are sold. But three weapons, if we're going to win in the battleground of relationships, how do we do it? How do we take hold of these weapons that have divine power, the first of which is the weapon of confession, which brings about the death of pride. The weapon of confession. So on August 8th, 2008, one of the most critical moments in our story, I was actually went that afternoon to a room similar to this. I was sitting in the very back of the room and Beth Moore was preaching on the screen. And I'll never forget in the middle of her message, she said, there is a girl in this room that is in a pit so deep she can't see her way out. And I knew she was talking straight to me. See, I had caused this pit of emotional pain and devastation. And as I'm sitting there, she said, hey, and Jesus just wants you to know he loves you. He's for you. There's hope for you. And I believe that moment was such an example of just God's spirit supernaturally transferring to me because when I got home that evening, it was the first time that I confessed to Josh what had been happening. And you see, what had been going on is since May the 29th, our third son was born and he was in the NICU. And over about a year before that, I had started having what I know now is an emotional affair with another man. 
But during the course of that time where the enemy is just waiting, prowling like a lion, you know, this is a tender moment in our marriage. We're so sad about our son. And it was in that moment that with the other couple, the husband had said, you know, I have feelings for you. And it began what I call just the summer of hell. I didn't know up from down, left from right. I just continued to give more and more of my heart away to this other man. And all the way to the point of August 8th, when the woman comes in that night after I had left the Beth Moore simulcast, she comes and she's sitting on our couch and she starts to cry. And she's like, something is going on in my marriage. I don't think my husband loves me. She said, I, I think there's another woman. And Josh is saying to her like, no, absolutely not. Like, I know your husband. He would never do that. And as I see her crying and her pain, she walks out the door. And what I say now is just a bad miracle how the Holy Spirit got this confession out of my mouth as I just looked at Josh and said, like, what if it's me? What if I'm the problem? Like, what if I'm the cause of all this pain? And you know, the thing about that moment is that if Beth Moore would have looked at me in that screen and told me, there's a girl in a pit so deep, she can't see her way out, and your path, your weapon to get out of it is confession, I would have never believed her. Because the truth is, what this world tells us is that if you're hiding something, if you're in a pattern of secret shame, you better not tell anyone, you better fix it, you better end this relationship, remedy it, and hope no one ever knows because otherwise you're about to dig yourself a way deeper hole, a way deeper pit. But the truth is that is not what this word, his word tells us, that it's through confession, it's through vulnerability, being honest about our brokenness, our shame, our insecurities, our vulnerabilities, that we actually find healing. And so from that moment on, it changed us because what, we, what I started to do, we called it confession therapy, but I started to realize how much freedom came by not hiding anymore, by being able to come to Josh with these vulnerable parts of my heart and mind and tell him and confess to him what was going on. Yeah, and the reality up to that point in our relationship, there had been very little confession about anything. In fact, I'd say that night where she said, hey, what if it's me, was kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, where for the next year and a half, it was this two steps forward, three steps back of confession and pain that would then build intimacy as she would remember more and more things or places or whatever it may be that she would bring and confess to me. And nobody had ever told me when we got married that I needed to be the man and have the answers and and pretend or posture to lead our family spiritually or lead and provide for our family. But there was all this pressure that I had put on myself that on any given moment of the journey, whether it was in marriage or professionally or in parenting, like I never would have raised my hand to say, man, I don't, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I feel wildly insecure when it comes to certain parts of our marriage or when it comes to my kids like I'm ripping them one in the car on the way to church to make sure they stay in line for at least the hour and a half we're there. You know, it's like, it was a lot that I, I didn't know, but I was carrying this pressure to posture and not confess. So that, that season brought about really for the first time that we started confessing things to each other. And in my pain for what Katie had done in those decisions, man, it brought about an openness in me to share things I had never told her or anyone for that matter, going back to my childhood of stuff that I just kept locked up. I'm not telling anybody about that. And the reality of what Katie's talking about, James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We don't realize that it's our pride that keeps us silent because we're trying to posture as strong or capable or able-bodied to do whatever it is that we're doing. But really, it's our pride, man, that keeps us quiet. And God stands in opposition to us. When you sit across the table from somebody to confess anything, and I acknowledge our story is a bit extreme, but man, whether it's a sin, a struggle, an attitude of your heart. I know recently Katie's had conversations with girlfriends where she's just sat down and said, hey, listen, I feel really insecure when I'm around you because of X, Y, and Z. That just sounds like a crazy conversation, something you would ever do. But confession actually builds intimacy. On the other side of it, right. you can feel safe. You can feel known and trusted because you've really shared the difficult things with one another and gone beyond a surface right. relationship and made the decision to love. James 5, 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may 
be healed. We know that we can come before God for forgiveness, but oftentimes we can be a people that walk away forgiven and not healed because we're not willing to really take that step to confess to someone else in our life. It makes me think about Mac mm. Mood. We've been on staff for just over 15 years now at Seacoast, and there's been two times where in some kind of departmental transition, I was leading a department that Mac Mood was a part of, and he'd be in a conversation or a meeting with somebody and say something about me that he thought after the fact might have sounded dishonoring. And so he would follow up with that person, but he always gave me a call to say, man, I was having this conversation and this was said, and I just want to apologize. I, I called them and apologized, but I just wanted you to know and hear it from me. And you would think that would create awkwardness and division, but what it actually does is let me know, man, I can be safe with Mac yeah. and, and really trust him. That's right. You know, if we're going to win the battleground of relationships, especially as a church, Jesus calls us the family of God. He says that we are the body of Christ. So this group isn't like a membership. It's not a club that we join. It's a living body, right? And so if we're going to win in this battleground, we're going to have to be a people of confession. It's not sitting with somebody to accuse them. You hurt me. You did this. I think this about you. Instead, it's vulnerably giving them our pieces of brokenness. I feel this way. You know, this is something that I've been struggling with, but we're going to watch the death of our pride, and then we're going to watch this supernatural unity as we win the battle. So is there anything in your life that you need to confess, any sin that you've never shared with anyone? We're going to give you just a moment to do that with your neighbor now. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I like how there's, there's immediate laugh, like not God doing that. <laughs> but what I do want to invite you to do, seriously, is just to pray and search your heart. Chances are the one or two things, whatever it is, are top of mind. You don't have to spend time thinking about it. At the end of the service, we're going to invite you to go and light a candle and just pray in the same way that Katie called it a bad miracle. I know that it was the Holy Spirit. Man, that distance between your heart and your mouth your brain and your mouth can feel like the biggest hurdle to get over just to yeah. get the words out of your mouth. But you can light a candle and pray, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you help me get this out to my spouse? Help me get this out to my friend. And in a very practical way, it's you taking up the weapon of confession and stripping the enemy of his power. So if we're going to win in the battleground of relationships, the first weapon we have to take up is the weapon of confession. The second is the weapon of forgiveness. And probably it, it is the death, death of self-righteousness. And it's probably the, the question that I get asked as it pertains to our story more than any other. People would be like, how did you really forgive Katie? And it's asked as if there's some kind of like special pastoral muscle that I flex in moments that I need to forgive. <laughs> like, I forgive you. you know, like, uh, when in reality, like it, it wasn't anything that I that I did. I realized in that season that there was no switch that I could flip in Katie's heart to make her uh, want to stay with me or make her love me again. And so in that season, one, to deal with my own pain, to deal with my own anger. Uh, Katie was the only one that had a job here at the time. When we moved to Charleston, it was like, okay, God, one of us need a job. So whichever one gets it, the other will stay home. And I had the joy of being the stay-at-home dad with uh, three kids. <laughs> and in that season, I, I made it through the day because of nine o'clock and one o'clock. I'd have the kids have a morning rest and an afternoon rest. And Katie would be like, hey, babe, the kids aren't supposed to have two rests in one day. I was like, hey, babe, well, while I'm the stay-at-home dad, they might have three because I, <laughs> I, my mind, man, I would, I would be making a snack for the kids and all of a sudden this movie reel in my mind would turn on of me trying to visualize things that she had confessed or shared with me. And before I know it, I'm like, white knuckle on the steering wheel or standing there with all these emotions, just angry. Mm -hmm. And I needed nine o'clock and one o'clock for me to go after God. Scripture tells us he's close to the brokenhearted, saves those that are crushed in spirit. So man, I would be journaling. I would be in the word really just to get me through the day. But it was in that time where I was going hard after God. You don't, you don't confront a holy God and not be confronted with your own sin as well. And so as I would be praying, God, give me your heart for Katie. God, give me your eyes for Katie. What I was constantly seeing was his heart for me mm -hmm. and his eyes 
for me. Perhaps the best picture of that is Luke 23, 34. This is Jesus on the cross for the very people he had come to seek and save after they had mocked and persecuted and beaten and crucified him. His prayer was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. And it's easy when you've been hurt by someone to, to villainize them, to point a finger at them. But what Jesus reminds us of here is that who they are is not what they do. When we're in a dark place, man, we're capable of doing dumb stuff. And all of us are one step away from stupid. We don't like to think that way. But man, we, we have the capacity to make awful decisions. And his prayer was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any one of you has grievous grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. How I forgave Katie was this pursuit of God and constant reminder of my own need for forgiveness to where ultimately God gave me his heart for her. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says it this way, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your father will not forgive your sins. And I think all too often in the body of Christ, we can be quick to say the words because we know it's what we're supposed to do. It's what we need to do. I forgive you. Uh, but then you walk away from the conversation still gripped with pain or anger or sadness, whatever it may be. And the reality in our story and all of our stories is whether it's a marriage or a friendship, man, forgiveness is a process that takes time yeah. of you receiving God's heart so that you can share it with others. That's right. You know, we, if you find yourself there today, I think back, we tell this story 16 years later and um, but you, you can't imagine the pain, you know, and there's the truth is there's just no elevator you can take on the pain. Every single person has to walk those stairs when you've been hurt or wounded. And so we empathize so much with people that are in that place. But the reason why forgiveness is this weapon that is the death to our own self-righteousness is because we have to remember how much we've been forgiven. You know, self-righteousness can be this church word, but basically it just means like having our own right standing before God through ourself. And that's the opposite of our faith. The truth is Romans 3 tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, no, not one. Because the truth of our faith is the fact that none of us outgrow the cross, right? That we all have been forgiven. And if we're going to be a people of confession, we're also going to have to be a people of forgiveness that not only can extend forgiveness to those that have hurt us, wounded us, but also that fully receive that forgiveness to our, for ourselves, right? Because in our story, Josh's forgiveness for me was so marking, but what changed my life was hearing Jesus's forgiveness over me, receiving his love that he knew my darkest day, my worst sin, and still drew close to me, still loved me even on that worst day. That's what started to bring about death of that self-righteousness. And I started to realize we could live free and open and vulnerable before yeah. God and others. So is there anyone in your life, including yourself, that you need to extend forgiveness? Today at the end of the service, we're gonna invite you to go to a cross. One, so that you can receive forgiveness from God, that you can be reminded of his incredible love for you, that he would send his son to mm -hmm. die for you, but also so that you could write out whatever that grievance is and leave it there on the cross to walk away with freedom from that. So if we're going to win in the battleground of relationships, number one, we've got to take up the weapon of confession. Number two, we've got to take up the weapon of forgiveness. And number three, which is Katie's Favorite, the weapon of vision, which is the death of complacency. I love vision. I really do. But the truth is Jesus loves vision too. So the definition of vision is just a clear mental picture of a preferred future, right? And Jesus came, walked this earth, giving us vision over and over again. That's why he called us the family of God, the body of Christ. He was telling us, hey, you're all valuable, you may feel sometimes like a big toe or something compared to Brandon Lake or other people, but you are not. You are valuable as the body of Christ. He kept giving us vision after vision. On the Last Supper, when he gathered the disciples together and he washed their feet, he was giving them the vision of, hey, you're here to serve, not to rule. This is our path. Our path is to lay down our life. He constantly gave us vision. 
And the truth is, I tell Josh, sometimes maybe I just like vision because I like fun. I wasn't really made to do hard things. I don't know. I don't want to go to war all the time. I don't want to sign up for a battle. But if you've ever led people, the, the truth is you have to give them vision. And many of you have businesses. You understand this. People have to have a why. They have to know why, where you're going. You can't just assume they're coming with you. And in your relationships, your most important relationships, your marriage, your friendships, your small group, the death of complacency happens when you give those relationships vision, right? You need to tell them, hey, this is who we are. This is what God's doing among us. This is where we're going. This is who we are as a people. And the relationship was not meant to just be complacent. We weren't supposed to think that people just came along with us. The, the most valuable possession to God is others, right, is people, and so we started crafting vision. There's a lot of ways to do that. We have it written in the book, the workbook. If you, We have a small group that's happening across many campuses. You can join. There's lots of practical tools that can help you craft vision around your relationships. But for us, we started to say our grandparent names. So one day on... That was our 13th, 13th anniversary. I woke up that morning and Katie said, well, this year for our anniversary, I need my name somewhere on your body. I did. I know. I'm an intense person, but I was like, I so think I it's got the Ruby, year my name Ruby goes on your body. tattooed on my ring finger, and I got this big butterfly on my back. <laughs> their name kind of. <laughs> we, we just came up with our grandparent names because a lot of our kids just named the grandparents whatever came out, and it would be like Peepaw or Kiki, which sounded like doo-doo. You know? So we're like, that's not happening to us. We're going to have these grandparent names. But when we started to have language for it, like we ours were Ruby and Bear. And so we'd say, who are they becoming? Where are they going? How do we want to end this thing? We would get vision for that. But all the time, we revisit our vision and put language around it. We met a couple the other day that were like, we're not empty nesters. We're on our second honeymoon. We're rediscovering all kinds of things about each other. That's what vision does. And Habakkuk 2.2, it tells us, write the vision down, make it plain so that the people can run. And, you know, Josh and I, we like to go on walks together at night just to kind of like talk about our day. And when we go out for those walks at night, we never talk about where we're going in the neighborhood. We're not like, okay, now we're going to go left and then turn right. We just go out for a walk. But I promise you, if the two of us are ever going to run, if we're going to run together, which doesn't happen often, <laughs> we need to know exactly where we're going. You're right? trying to call me out? No, I'm just saying, I mean, neither one of us do it a lot, but he is never. So anyways, but if, <laughs> if we were going to run, Good. we would have to have a vision. We'd probably have to, you know, go to Starbucks, have some kind of why, and then walk back. You have to have vision, but that's because running is what? Challenging. Well, your relationships are challenging, your yeah. friendships, your small group, your marriage. So vision is just putting a name on what is God doing? What is he saying to us? And then what are we running after? What's our why to watch our passion increase? Yeah, and oftentimes we can be frustrated in relationships that we've never actually given vision to. Uh, Lynn yeah. Stroy's got a group of girlfriends that for 15 years, they've had a girls weekend once a year. She's, she used to work at a law firm and a girl at the firm was going away on a girls weekend. She was like, yeah, we do this once a year. You ought to do it with your girlfriends. And so they started in that season when they all lived there in Columbia. And now 15 years later, they all get away one weekend of the year. They all live in different cities. They watch Seacoast online. One message Lynn after the first service and says, oh my gosh, that's us. He's talking about us. <laughs> so, but they had vision for the relationship. Just this past week, I had a friend with a milestone birthday, turned 50, and uh, typically he's the guy that I, I call, hang, cut up with a lot, and because we've been moving, book stuff, I didn't call him or even talk to him. A couple days went by, and I just felt like a loser friend, and so I had to reach out to him and say, man, I am so sorry that I didn't call and celebrate you on the big day. I want to make it up to you. He was like, well, hey, you had the book, the move, blah, 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 a bunch going on. Don't you worry about it. And I was like, no, dude, there's no, there's no excuse. Uh, I'm either that kind of friend for you or I'm not. And I dropped the ball. And he said, well, hey, I know that if I called you in the middle of the night, if something was going down, you'd be the first to show up at the house. And so that's all that matters. And, and for me, it was a define the relationship kind of moment and that it gave vision to the kind of friend we want to be for each other. Vision will not only compel yeah. you as a couple to lean into and run after your future, future together, but it'll define the relationships that you, uh, that you have now, give you some shared expectations as to what you're experiencing and going after together. Yeah. 
So one of the lowest moments in our story was so marking to me, and it's a moment that Josh doesn't even remember all that well, and it truly changed my life, is we had been in Columbia, this is around December, so from August to December, and what I say is like no man's land. We couldn't, didn't have a church. We had been asked to leave our church, not good counseling, so isolated. And we knew we were being called to move to Charleston. We just wanted to attend Seacoast and be around Mac and Cindy Lake. And so that night we're packing up the house or that day. And I watched Josh, you know, people that are so relational, had so many friends who now at this point in our life are so isolated. And I watched him that whole day, just one man, go back and forth to this huge U-Haul, moving us like all on his own. And I was so broken and so sad by watching this all go down. And we drove to Charleston, got the kids settled here, and then we had to drive back to Columbia. You know, for that like second move where there's the stuff in the attic you've forgotten and all that kind of stuff. So we drive back to Columbia and we're in this empty house. No furniture there. And I'm upstairs going through all these journals and things in the attic. And I found all these journals that I had made Josh from 18, 19 years old that said like Snooky Boo Boo, you know, I love you so much, rainbows, hearts everywhere. And I was like, never change. You're so incredible. You know, all these (laughs) journals. And I just was looking at these things in so much pain. And I remember I like brought all the journals downstairs. So I'm like walking downstairs to Josh with holding these things. And when I get downstairs to this totally empty house, He has made this huge heart shaped out of rose petals, almost as if there's candles, like he's seen my pain all day, and he just wanted to show me this love. And when I come down in this moment, I have all these journals, and and I just was so broken and so full of shame, and I just said, like, I don't know if I feel these emotions anymore for you. Like, I don't know if I feel this way. Do you honestly feel like this for me? And it was in that moment that he looked at me and he said, Katie, I'm asking you to go to a deeper place of love, a new place of love. I'm not asking you to go back to that old place. I'm asking you to go to a new place of love. You know, in that moment, he chose in my vulnerability, brokenness, to extend me so much forgiveness, so much compassion, and also vision for, hey, I want us to go to a new place. And from that moment on, 16 years later, I do not look at this man without thinking about that moment, right? Four kids later and so much love and life and adventure that we've experienced. We've also hurt each other, right? We've failed each other many times, but that moment marked me and it changed me forever. And, you know, when I think about each of you sitting here this morning, The gift I really want to give you is the fact that that is what Jesus does for us. That is the moment he gives us. When we come to him broken, vulnerable, when we confess to him stuff that we wish no one knew. You know, Josh did not have to extend me forgiveness in that moment. Jesus did not have to come and die for all of us, but he chose to. And when we see the cross, he wants us to forever be changed by that. He wants us to look at that cross and never forget that moment, that we don't outgrow it, that we don't have to hide as the people of God, that we can live free, we can live open, we can live vulnerably, and then we can extend forgiveness to each other. We can have vision for each other. He constantly gives us vision that, hey, there is more. Mm. There is more. I have abundant life for you. So if you're here this morning, I just ask every single person to bow with me. And if you're hearing for the first time these words. Hey, before words, you do that, let me interrupt you. Yeah. I, um, I felt like when you said that, that uh, I'm not inviting you to go get back to an old place, but inviting you to go to a new place. I feel like that's a word for each of you today, that mm-hmm. in whatever place you might be in, uh, one of the kind of driving passages for us has been 2 Corinthians 1. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of compassion and God of all comfort, Mm -hmm. who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So anytime we come and share any portion of our story, the Mm -hmm. prayer is that in some way there's a supernatural transfer, not of best practices or marriage tips that we've learned, but in a very real sense we experience the power of God in our weakness. Scripture says in our weakness, his power is made perfect. And I would say in the most broken and vulnerable place you could imagine, man, we experience the power of God. And we would not have become individually or collectively who we are 
had we not walked through the valley together. And so today, if it's in your marriage, if it's in your faith, if you're here with a friend and just saying like, man, I need to go to a new place, I'd love to invite you to just bow your head, (laughs) grab your spouse's hand if you're married and there in the just silence of your own heart, if you would say, man, I want to go to a new place. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a new place in our marriage. Maybe it's a new place with God. Would Mm -hmm. you just raise your hand for me so we could pray over you? Mm Mm-hmm. Amen. God, we thank you so much for every hand that's raised, and we thank, we're thankful that you are the God who makes all things new. Mm-hmm. God, that you can meet us in the, the darkest of places, whether it's pain that we cause because of our own sin mm-hmm. and pride and flesh, if it's trouble that's found us, if there's been ways that we've not only walked a dark path but partnered with the enemy and brought about death and destruction in our lives, that you do not look at us with eyes of condemnation and anger, Mm -hmm. that you grieve over our sin. Think about you looking out over Jerusalem and weeping. And I just pray that each of us in our own way today, if it's in our marriage, if it's in our friendships, if we're feeling alone, if it's in our relationship with you, might we encounter the God of love the God of grace, the God who can make all things new. God, would you do a new work in our marriages? Would you do a new work in our hearts? Might we not settle for superficial relationships where we share common interests in sports or clothes or hobbies, but might we really carry one another's burdens, bear one another's burdens, Mm -hmm. that life might feel a little lighter, that we could feel a little more known, a little more seen, and a lot more loved. God, move mightily today as we respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.